Uh, good morning, and thank you for uh, for coming to adult education this morning. Um, we are going to, uh, maybe I should say, I am P.D. Lund, and I am one of the members of the Wauwatosa Persisters, and also a um, member of St. Matthew's. Um, and the three of us are, are going to give you a look at who the Persisters are, and what we do, and how, how what we do is a reflection of our faith. Um, so, uh, may we start with a word of prayer. O oh God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, we ask you to open our eyes and our ears so that we might know the work that you would like us to do with our heads, our hearts, our hands, and our feet. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for coming. I'm Lisa, also a member of St. Matthews and a member of Persisters. And I thought I'd just start a little bit to tell you what Persisters is and uh, a little bit of, about when we started and why. Um, so we are a group of people, um, engaged citizens is what I say. Um, who feel that it's part of our calling and responsibility um, to be engaged in our democracy. And I have talked to, well, my dad has passed away, but my mom and dad many times in the past, I grew up in a household where we did talk about the political affairs of the nation quite a bit, and I always remember them talking about having civics in school which we didn't have as a subject. We had a subject called social studies, but it didn't really seem like civics. And what my parents grew up with was this profound sense of responsibility as a member of um, our democratic society. And I, I think perhaps I didn't grow up with that in society as much, maybe a little bit more in my family. At any rate, I have always felt this draw to um, understand or participate in our democratic process. And many people do that, and they think the way I do that is I vote. And that is the most important way. But uh, a couple of years ago, I, I, I felt like I wanted to do something more. I was feeling a little bit like I don't want to just be listening to the news and being angry or feeling hopeless. I wonder if by gathering with others, I'll feel a sense of community the way that we feel at church. And um, I think the power of fellowship um, is part of what I was drawn to. Um, I think of myself, number one, as a child of God, and then being many other things after that, probably not being a, a mother or wife and so on. But I'm also blessed to live in this country. And I live in a country which is a democracy. And what that means to me is that I have a role. I have a responsibility. So when I was starting to get these feelings of frustration, and I, hopelessness might be too strong of a term, but I thought, I don't want to just be Connor and I at the breakfast table railing about this or that. I want to gather. I want a gathering. And maybe um, I felt that way because I often do that with girlfriends or this and that. But, so I decided, I'm going to just throw it out there in an email and see, does anybody else feel like I do? And I sent out an email to many dear friends, some of whom I thought had an interest in the political uh, aspect of our, of our nation. And I said, do you want to just come to my house on a Friday? We're just going to write letters, and I'm not sure what it's going to be. And the first week, uh, Kristen Charleston showed up, and I think three others, I think there were five of us. And I just sat around a table like this with letters and postcards and said, I'm not sure what this is going to be, but I feel called to, to raise my voice as a, a member of this country um, to let my elected representatives know, and maybe you do too. And that's how Persisters started. It was just a small gathering of women around my um, dining room table on a Friday morning. And it has now been almost three years 
of nonstop. Um, we, we, we never miss a Friday. And one Friday in almost three years, it was just PB and I. Otherwise, it's always a group. And the group can, anybody is welcome. And it's for an hour, and that works well. I was a parent of a um, elementary school student at Lincoln, and I said, we're gonna do it right after school drop off. So it's 8.30 till 9.30. Now my child is no longer there, and anyway, that's the time. It's 8.30 till 9.30, Friday mornings, my house on Underwood Avenue, and people come when they can, and they write what they like. But it developed into uh, an idea where I would also provide ideas of things that we could write about. Kristen's gonna talk a little bit more about that. It also developed into, I ne we never meant to for it just to be women. I know the, the, <laughs> the title is Persisters, and that came from uh, a, um, uh, we were inspired um, at the time by a woman who is now running for president, but at that time the senator, Senator Warren, was in um, on the floor of the Senate and she was try, trying to make a, a case about something and the Senate Majority Leader said to her, you must sit down, you must be quiet, and then the, she kept talking and uh, he, his statement afterwards was, she was told, she was warned, nevertheless she persisted. And that's where we took the name from. And it wasn't because of any political identification for one or the other. It was more of this idea of persistence. And I have to say, as the person who hosts it, there are many times where I've, I've felt like giving up. And then I look at it and I go, we called it Persisters. <laughs> we will not give up. There are times we're confused, we're frustrated, we're sad, we're heartbroken. But we find a comfort and um, fellowship in being together and whether our letters and calls have the desired impact I don't think we know we put it out there as a gesture and with hope mm -hmm. and for some of us in the group we're very moved by our faith but it, it's just the action that we have taken so we've taken a lot of power from this gathering and persisting together and um, we are largely a group of women, but men come too. Um, my husband, my nephews, friends have come, but it is largely women who come after they drop their kids off to school or not, and come for an hour and write letters, and there's power in that. Um, we're active participants in our democracy. We feel called to that. Um, as I said, we feel like our first responsibility is to vote, but as members of the democracy, what what do you have to do in order to vote? You have to inform yourself in order to be a voter. We have talked many times that sometimes we go to the polls and we go, well, I knew very much who I was supporting in this and this and this, but then there's these other candidates. Oh boy, quick, text somebody. Who should I vote for for this? <laughs> so we try to inform each other. We try to inform ourselves. We share resources about how we can be informed as voters. And um, if, it, if we're moved, to it, we become more involved in an issue that's very important to us. And different people in our group have different issues that are very important to us. Um, so I, some of you may have um, read an article that was written by Jim Stingle. It was in the paper. We brought copies. And I thought he told our story better than I could. Um, but he did say, if you read it, you know, at the end he said, as you can tell by this um, the story, these women lean progressive. But it's not that, um, that that is the only thing that is welcome. But we also don't want to say that that's not the way the, the members of the group lead. I want to be completely transparent. But we've had very difficult conversations. Many of us grew up in a wide variety of ways with a wide variety of backgrounds. And we believe in respect and civic dialogue and active participation in our process. And that matters no matter which direction you lean. Um, so I hope that that comes across, but I also just wanted to be, didn't want anybody to feel like they've been duped um, about you know the direction that we generally lean. Um, so that is a little bit about Persisters, how we started, how we got our name, what we do, and we have grown. Um, we've grown over these almost three years. There's a couple other 
um, groups that have started as a result. They can pursue whatever they choose to do. The idea is that putting pen to paper or making a call in community has power. Whether it has power to our elected officials, we don't always know the answer to that. But we do feel it's important to share our voice. And we do get a sense of belonging when we're together. And that gives us hope to continue. And I think without that hope, it's too easy to get frustrated and to give up. So we persist. <laughs> Did you want to do the slides first? Maybe, maybe oh, we could do part of them anyway. Okay. Uh, maybe up to the right. action. Should I talk through a few of them? Okay. Um, so Kristen and Petey and I are very moved by this as it being one of the um, things that calls us to this type of action. And we've read it many times at St. Matthew's. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? That's a, that's, a, that's a tall bar, and at our best, that's what we hope to do. It's kind of my problem. <laughs> Petey, do you want to speak about this one? Petey made this great slide. Okay. Um, oh, actually, I didn't make it. I borrowed it. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, all the key words. I thought you pulled them together from some of our action sheets. Oh, would that I did. Okay, <laughs> okay. so some of the key, uh, key points in our, um, that motivate us. All of the things that go together with being part of a democracy. We, what do we do besides calling and writing on a Friday morning? <clears throat> we have a lot of energy, we get fired up. And, um, this isn't by any means anything that's planned much in advance, but somebody might come on a Friday and say, who wants to join and go on this march? The march on the, on the left there was for public schools. Mm -hmm. Stacy Lynch, our, our state representative, Robin Vining in the middle, and Karen Zimmerman, mm -hmm. uh, all her sisters. And we marched to, uh, we were part of a march to the state capitol to ask for uh, public school financing. We donate money. We, so a uh, really beautiful thing started happening. We have a box in the middle of the table and everybody shoots their letters into the box when they're done. And at the end, I have the great joy of looking at that beautiful pile of letters and taking them to the, to the post office. And it feels just fantastic. But people unbeknownst to me started throwing money in. And I was like, I don't need money because people are throwing in stamps too. So what are we gonna do? So we started choosing things to donate to. And again, just things that are on our heart. We've sent donations to many things, a couple of thousand dollars over the years. Um, from um, sex, uh, There's a group called Exploit No More that works to fight sex trafficking in the city of Milwaukee to um, support Healthy Women, Healthy Babies initiatives. We also, so many different areas that we collect money for and make donations to, um, just because for, people are throwing in money. We, uh, tr we invite um, our candidates and legislators to meet with us. And this meeting was our state senator, Dale Kuyenga, came to meet with her sisters. And it was wonderful, and it was such a big group that we met at the Wauwatosa Library. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, so those are some of the other things we do. Yes, we support <laughs> candidates. Um, <laughs> So we have had many candidates come to Persisters meetings. I don't know how they find out, but they do. And then they, when, the, 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 when, the, <laughs> when the election was happening um, last year, we had many candidates come and just ask if they could talk to us. There's our key Persister, my sister. <laughs> uh, but Cheryl's daughter-in-law, Kate Schroeder, who some of you know, Cheryl's son, John Jewett, Kate is running for Congress in Ohio, but she's a persister, and she was here two weeks ago, and we support her. She's not in our district, but we support her as a persister, and others, and we got yeah, babies. <laughs> and this yeah. is the other thing I wanted to mention, that it's an intergenerational group, as you can see, um, and uh, that has a lot of power as well. Mm -hmm. Um, the person who came most recently, he said, I just love looking around the table and seeing the, you know, from a one-year-old to um, a senior citizen. That's just wonderful. So, that. Oh, oh, celebrating? <laughs> <laughs> we drink. No, we drink. <laughs> uh, 
Where are the other people? <laughs> <laughs> that was just my trip. <laughs> that was on our second anniversary. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so celebrating, advocating. Thank you for all that. Great pictures. Okay, and Kristen's going to talk now about our actions. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kristen Charleston, also a member at St. Matthews. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we write about, but first I want to just um, give you a little bit of uh, why Persisters is important to me. Um, um, so through Persisters, I've not only uh, met many wonderful women, uh, but I've been motivated, inspired to do much more. Um, things that I wouldn't have done before being involved in this group. Um, I've gone on marches, like the Women's March, when I brought my children with me, and that was a wonderful experience. Um, I've become um, active in campaigns, uh, specifically Robin Bynings campaign. She's my state representative. Um, I even um, knocked on doors, like that, that's way out of my comfort zone, but um, <laughs> I, I did that and uh, felt uh, very motivated by that. Um, I've gone to candidate events, uh, talking to candidates, um, and going to debates or forums. Um, so, and I'll continue to do that as well. Um, so every week we have an action sheet that Lisa, usually Lisa puts together with suggestions on topics to write about. Um, uh, it's just a starting point, um, current um, events um, and, and things that uh, might inspire us. So we'll go over some, of, some examples of some of these topics. So our topics will range from uh, local, state, to national, and generally fit into three categories for our letter writing or calling, sometimes we call. Um, the, three can or the three categories are support for people or groups, letters to oppose something, um, and third is condolence letters or calls. So some of the examples, I'm just going to read through them because there's a lot of text there. Um, so letters of support examples are one was to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel uh, to please re report on the science of climate change. We need to raise a awareness about the science of climate change. Please include stories that reflect the finding of scientists. Listen to them and report their concerns. The threats to our children and to all life are too great to ignore. Another example is to Governor Tony Evers. Thank you for introducing the red flag legislation. The governor introduced legislation to create an extreme risk protection order, ERPO process that would allow a judge to remove guns from people who have been found by a judge to be in danger to themselves or others. Recent, a recent Marquette University law poll showed that 81% of Wisconsinites support ERPO legislation. <laughs> okay, so more examples of support to Mayor Nan Whaley. Thank you for your leadership on gun safety legislation. As a mayor, she is showing compassion and leadership in the wake of the mass shootings in Dayton in August and has become a national leader on gun safety. Whaley's priorities are to strengthen laws on straw purchases and background checks. She hopes to pass an assault weapons ban. And then also to the staff of the Washington Cathedral, thank you for publishing your views on the president's <coughs> message. The president had said that four freshman members of Congress should go back to the countries they came from. The faith leaders published their views stating, quote, as faith leaders who serve at Washington National Cathedral, the sacred space where America gathers, at moments of national significance, we feel compelled to ask, after two years of President Trump's words, actions, when will America have enough? Okay, letters that oppose. Some examples are to the White House. Oppose the reduction in the number of refugees allowed into the US. The White House has pr proposed reducing the number of refugees allowed into the US to a historic low of 18,000 people in 2020. This action denies our values as a people. We are a nation of immigrants and one of the wealthiest nations on earth. To deny our refuge to those suffering is a denial of what has made this nation great. Another example is to the White House and the Director of Homeland Security. Oppose the detention of children in migrant camps. 
the Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General found that several detention centers had serious <coughs> overcrowding and that they are a ticking time bomb. Letters of condolence. Um, <coughs> these really touch our heart. Um, and um, here's an example to the family of Koki Roberts. She died in September of 2019 at age 75 after decades as a respected journalist and beloved mem member at NPR and ABC. Another example is to Roland Velasco, mayor of Gilroy, California. We send our deepest condolences as you grieve the loss caused by the shooting at the Gilroy Garlic Festival. We will honor those who died and those who survived by advocating for common sense gun, leg gun legis legislation in our country. And then we often get letters back. Um, uh, PD got a letter back from the city of Gilroy Mayor's office. Um, so that was touching, they were appreciative. I have one more yeah. I didn't share this letter here, but we, whenever there's a mass shooting, we try to write to whoever we. Oh, when there, when there is a mass shooting, we try to write to um, who who might represent uh, families or. So if it's a church, we'll write to the church. If it's a, a city of Gilroy, we write to the mayor's <coughs> office. A school will write to the family of, of the people who were lost in care of the school and. Um, uh, one of the most amazing responses I I have received was a, just a tiny little envelope with a tiny little, almost like a post-it note um, from Texas and uh, from a mom who literally looked like she, you know, just had enough energy to, to write something on a post-it, just the mother of somebody who'd been lost to say how much the notes meant to her. And if there's ever a question, if I wonder what we're doing is right, that just sits in my bedside table. And then the next letter is a, a thank you after we had um, written a letter of uh, sympathy to the family of George H.W. Bush. Um, so in general, when writing or calling, we try to make the letters that we write more personal by trying to tell a personal story of why that issue is important to us. Um, we're finding a shared value and trying to write to the, to the recipient in that way. So. Uh, so my section is a little bit on um, how my faith plays in to all of this. Um, I, in fact, um, maybe would you pass out those? Yeah. Um, certainly, um, we start with the words that have been given to us uh, through the Bible. Um, the, the charge from Micah that uh, Lisa read earlier. And um, this quote from Hebrews is um, one that's always been important to me um, because um, my faith is very much linked to hope. Um, uh, and I will just reiterate um, a little of what Lisa said in the beginning, that we gathered um, because so many of us felt like we needed hope in this time of real division and sadness and violence in our country. And um, this Hebrews quote, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And every week um, when we gather, we don't know whether what we have to say will land on any, uh, any friendly ears. But um, every single week when Lisa reminds us of her sister's happening uh, that week, she always signs onward with hope. Um, and I think that does 
come from a deep place of faith. Um, and I want to, um, I, I hope all of you will take a look at what our church, what our ELCA has to say to us to encourage our participation in this world. Um, I will, I will um, let you, no, actually, I, okay, I've got this shaky voice. I'm not scared of you. I have a voice disorder, uh, and it's poopy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I talk. So um, maybe uh, if you can bear with me, I will read through this whole thing. I started uh, just highlighting what I thought was important. <laughs> and I really couldn't cut anything out. Um, so this is from the ELCA webpage. Um, and uh, under the title, Publicly Engaged Church. We are a publicly engaged church that rolls up our sleeves and gets to work. We do God's work in the world, the work of restoring and reconciling communities. We pursue justice and seek peace no matter how long the journey or how wide the chasm. Because we are grounded in God's love and forgiveness, we are well equipped to live and serve here and now in the world with all its complexities, tensions, and ambiguities. Hey, we're not waiting for heaven to do something. <laughs> there is no aspect of life in which God is not active. Isn't that good? Um, no place where God is not present. And this is exactly where we are called to participate in God's work in the thick of life, embracing individuals, families, and communities that are hungry for hope and healing, justice and peace, advocates and partners. Our faith and our call to boldly serve and love our neighbor take us into some interesting and challenging aspects of life. Advocacy, corporate social responsibility, racial justice, science and ethics, peacemaking, justice for women, social issues, and community organizing. We are drawn into every corner of life, society, and its institutions to bring the good news of Jesus Christ and to work for lasting positive change that upholds human dignity. You have a place in the ELCA and an important role in God's work in the world. So find ways to get connected to a community of faith and the work of our publicly engaged church. Um, thank you, members of the ELCA who wrote this. Um, just, uh, yeah, let me keep going. Um, uh, the very first social statement of our gathered ELCA in 1991 was one entitled Church in Society. That was one of the first things that the gathered leaders of the church um, felt we needed to listen to and to enact. Um, I think that almost all of us are familiar with um, the model that Jesus gave us in Matthew 25. Um, I know it's in the literature from John, uh, from Just One More Ministry, but it's the one where Jesus um, says, uh, where have you seen me hungry, or where the people say, where have we seen you, Lord, hungry and thirsty and a stranger? And Jesus answered um, that when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. 
When I was a stranger, you took me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And I know that many of you are involved in very hands-on ministry, um, that you do regularly feed the hungry, that you visit prisoners, that you work um, with the Stevens ministers to listen, to heal. And these are such important things to do. It is a little less, um, it's less personal, but more corporate to be an advocate. Um, but that's what we do. We see our work as, as persisters, as this other level of feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and housing the homeless because we work for just policies um, that make the difference in the corporate life of our nation. Um, all right, next topic. Um, when I write letters, I often mention my faith particularly to um, to public officials for whom faith um, is a basis of their actions. Um, and whenever I write to Senator Johnson, I almost always begin by saying, um, as a fellow Christian and a fellow Lutheran, um, my faith compels me to bring up this subject. Um, we met with, with uh, State Senator Koyenga, and after meeting with him, I have used that same language with him. I hope it doesn't seem manipulative, um, but I want him to know that that's where my values come from and um, my view of the work. Um, then, um, I have a question for you. I know that we cannot know the mind of God as mortals. But I wonder if you would dream with me for just a moment and think about, imagine what you think God's dream for this world is. And would you be willing to, to throw out um, a few words? Peace and harmony. I, I don't know if everyone heard, but peace and harmony. No hunger. No hunger. Unconditional love. <clears throat> Unconditional love. No cages. No. Cages. Cages. Oh, 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 okay. No cages. Music. Music. We put others first. Putting others first. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Safety. Safety. Um, and I, I know there are there are many many more things, but um, these are the things that we, as um, women, as moms, as some of us grandmas and aunties and um, 
lovers of the world. These are the things that we're advocating for. And these are the things that our faith is um, enjoining us to advocate for, for all. Um, and then uh, finally, um, why I am a persister. And this is the big reason. Um, together, we hope, and um, we don't always have babies at our meetings, but they certainly always remind us that this is the reason to carry on in hope. Um, and the other, the other thing is grace. And I warned uh, Lisa and Kristen that I am the worst person to be talking about anything that might make anybody in the world weepy. <laughs> because as, as um, I, I love this phrase, a woman who spoke to us once said, I have very easy access to my emotions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. Um, but the graces that we have seen have almost all come from uh, very personal um, uh, responses, even though we're often working on a very large canvas. Um, that the mayor of Gil Gilroy wrote to me, come on, uh, what a grace. Um, okay, deep breaths help. <laughs> um, uh, you might remember the rather bitter um, fight over health care um, in 2017. And we did, we made many calls. Uh, to our own senators, and we called uh, other senators and representatives throughout um, in, in Congress because everybody was voting. Whether we could vote for them or not, they vote on our behalf. Um, and uh, as all this was going on, uh, one day, I called Senators, or excuse me, um, Representative Sensenbrenner's office. And um, what I did was uh, talk to his young staffer. Come on. <laughs> Big girl pants. <laughs> About our daughter who has MS, and, and she's doing great. I mean, I'm not weeping because she's not, she is. But I told this young staffer about her pre-existing condition and what losing health care would mean to her. She works with homeless youth in San Francisco. Um, she makes a difference every day in the world. And, and I guess I was talking a little like this to him. And I said, what if she couldn't work anymore? That would be a hole in the safety net in a lot of kids. And this lovely young man in, of, in Congressman Sensenbrenner's office said, oh, Oh, ma'am, don't worry. It'll never pass the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I'm sure that his boss wouldn't want him, want him saying that. But, you know, we are often on different sides of the fence with, with, sen with a Congressman sen Sensenbrenner's office. And here was this young man ministering to me. And that is a grace. Okay, now I have to wipe my nose. That's <laughs> great. <laughs>
Thank you. She makes me cry all the time. It's my gift. And laugh my head off, honestly. Oh my goodness. We have one of the members of Persisters who always comes out with a witty Mark Twain line right at the right moment, and we're like, everybody brings what they've got. It's great. Uh, so I thought we'd turn it back to the group a little bit here. And uh, what Pastor Matt uh, one time talked about, I, I don't know if it was in a large group or a small group that I was with him, and he talked about this, and maybe he could even say it better than me right now, but um, in terms of determining um, our calling or where we're called to act, um, what breaks your heart? And uh, I could say that uh, Persister started on that, before I heard that statement, but started on that, dispel hopelessness, but act on what breaks my heart. And so I would say each week when we do actions, we take anybody's ideas. We're not um, trying to, and, and we always have a, a large table of stationary postcards um, and people can write whatever they want. I mean, nobody is saying what to write about. The idea is to raise your voice, share your ideas with your elected officials. We always have, uh, we try to have all of the um, necessary contact information. These are hanging on my wall every week. I just brought them from home. So people will know who to contact. Many people who have joined for Sisters have never written or called. Um, their representatives before, and we really encourage each other in that too. Um, and that's a wonderful feeling when somebody who maybe never did before was like, wow, I, their power in putting a pen to paper. Uh, one of our guests said, you know, um, a handwritten note cuts through a lot of noise. And don't we need that? Don't we need something to cut through the noise, make our connection to one another? whether we agree or disagree, to do it in a respectful way, to see each other in a more humane way. Um, so the question I have to you guys, and you may choose to pick up a postcard and write something today or not. You may choose to take one with you or not. Um, but if you would share your ideas, I will tell you, we'll bring them to Persisters next week. Um, so what I want to ask you is, what breaks your heart? And then maybe could, we could talk about um, who would we contact and what would we ask. So the first question is, what breaks your heart? And then we'll kind of put it in the persisters strategy. Who would we contact and what would we ask? So if anybody has something, yeah. I think the most heartbreaking thing is the fight of the refugees being turned away and refused in the country. So on um, refugee issues, we, we have used a great um, resources from others and one of them is from Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services LIRS.org and they have wonderful statements they do action so sometimes what I'll do when it's a refugee issue say there's something new that has come up in the news um, do you just want to use that alarming message from that week news item from that week or put it into a larger context putting it into a larger context I really like to use LIRS, a variety of news sources, always so important not to just look for one. One of my librarian friends shared a really helpful rubric which puts all of our different news sources on a, um, on a, Continue. thank you, I was going to say timeline, and you can, you know, if you tend to read over here, maybe once in a while read over here, if you tend to be in the middle, but it, it's a helpful reminder for me, and so we try to go to the sources <coughs> and get some information that's not highly charged and say um, on this refugee issue last week we wrote because the number of refugees being allowed in is going to go to the lowest level ever in the United States who would we write anybody have something there that they would say who, who would I write White House the White House so often with that issue we will write to the White House We've well, done that as well. Yeah. No, thank you. That just reaffirms that that's exactly what we like I say, we want your ideas. 
that on that issue, we would go to the national level. We might write our senator, our congressman, the White House, Homeland Security. On that issue, we've been quite consistent over the months. We've written many, many times. Yeah. Anything else that breaks your heart? <clears throat> the division that we all hear and see and feel in our country. And while there's always been um, plenty of room and reason for disagreement, <clears throat> I think rarely have we seen this level of division. And, and I think just most recently there are people um, that are saying that our division among among us as as neighbors in the community and families and friends <clears throat> are arguably the biggest threat to our national security right now. So, <clears throat> you know, so on, I'll just say it out loud for the camera. On our divisions as a nation, who who could we write? How would we express that as a persisters action? <clears throat> Who's responsible? I can tell you who's responsible. Media. Yep. Okay. So media, we have actually often written to newspapers to ask for balanced coverage. I'm sorry, Chris, I shouldn't let you do that. <laughs> I was just going to suggest, you know, well, start with your local media and then maybe, you know, up to the national, up to a more national media like the New York Times or the Washington Post or but start with your local, even even your wall plus a paper and of course the journal sentinel. So right to your local media. I, I'd like to add on this issue about the media is some of us, every, we all get our source, get our media or, and take it in from different sources. I, I tend to only look at things online. I never see the news on t television anymore. But some people see uh, reporters on the news who they find are acting with great courage. And we write to those people. So we really like to, um, to, I think that goes back to the division thing, civility, to try to uh, write in a way that's respectful, whether we agree or disagree. But especially if we see somebody that we might normally disagree with, and they've done something that we say, wow, tell that person. Let's make that bridge. So um, we've often done that to people who we thought have acted courageously in the media. And I know there's a lot of division, but I also know that some of them are doing a very hard job and have to be courageous. We do like to call out people who we think are courageous. Yeah. I can, I can expand on that a little. Yeah. Thank you. A lot of you know I was an elected official for 10 years. And one of the things that, and people today still believe that Act 10, which was enacted in 2012, covers all Wisconsin employees, with state, uh, state, municipal, county. It's that nothing could be further from the truth. And I had one heck of a time trying to convince people when I was voting for the uh, pension plan, for the uh, uh, union for the city of Wauwatosa that it did not cover some of their People just absolutely would refuse to believe me because Bellin said so, Wagner said so, all these people on the media said it covers all of the employees. It doesn't. It only covered people who were in the state pension and the state health care plan. In other words, Milwaukee County employees have their own health care and their own pension plan. They're not covered by Act 10 at all. But people wouldn't believe that. And even today, I, I correct these people on CNN and it drives my wife nuts. Because, oh, she listens to Wolf Blitzer, she wins to all these people. And they could they don't know what they're talking about. Because from the President of the United States on down, you had all those words up there, to the, the smallest village trustee all raise their hand and swear an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. And Nancy Pelosi is one of the first ones who has forgotten that. This whistleblower. Who is this person? Because the Constitution says an accused has the right to face his accuser. Who is this person? And secondly, did this person hear the conversation with their own ear? Because if someone on the staff told them, 
That's hearsay. And this whistleblower I'm gonna isn't stop even qualified. This isn't the forum for this, yeah. this conversation. So I'm going to ask that we, to we move on to a different, a different way of... Well, so I'll, you I'll have just, to know the truth. I will, I'll put it back into what I would consider the persisters rubric is. Who can you contact with your concern and what would you say? So that's what we try to do. Who would we contact and what would we say? Yes. I just have a question. Um, have you found it's more um, it's more beneficial to to write letters than than to email because you know we my husband and I have always done email. Yes. So um, there are some members who choose to do by email, and some people who just find power in putting a pen to paper. And I can't say maybe the other persisters could say whether they feel that one is better or the other. I think it comes from your own individual preference. Raising your voice, I think. The age of the lawmaker might have it in the I mean, the, yeah. or their staffers, or I mean, the, um, I met with uh, Senator, State Senator Melissa Sargent, and she said, for her, it did not, she spoke to a bunch of us who went for an advocacy day this spring, and she said it didn't matter um, how you contacted, but that her office keeps track of which constituents write, and I can concur with that because at one point, um, I was meeting with Senator Kayenga, who was then Representative Kayenga, and he told me that Connor Williams from St. Matthew's Church was the most frequent communicator with him in the entire district. Um, so I don't know if you knew that, but he knew that. And, I mean, so I think that it seems like, at least at the state level, the medium is, is less important. I don't know at a federal level. Yeah, I, I think we have stuck to pen and paper because it feels good to us rather than because we think that that gets through more. If somebody else has insight on that, I'd love to hear it. He does answer email. I've heard elsewhere that written is taken more seriously than emails and phone calls are right up there too. When you write, do you use uh, literally pen and ink or do you have to yeah. type out? No, we use just pen and paper. <clears throat> Often we'll use um, postcards that um, this or with other messages on them. Um, hmm. So it's you know, easy to see, it kind of catches your eye. If you figure if that lands on a desk, they might look at it and read it. I, I, I am a frequent caller of Susan Barrett's office, and I've gotten this idea that, oh, they know who I am. It's like, oh, put it in the box. Do you have that? Oh, concern? they know who we are. <laughs> That's just her I, I have to give great credit to that office. They are professional and kind in every in every call, but they certainly know. Yeah, Lisa, Underwood Avenue, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> um, quite a few years ago, I went through familial community organizing training, and one of the the key takeaway that I still remember from from that week of training was the most pro it, the most powerful way to advocate is through organized, organized voice, a group, you know, organized voice and organized money. That's who elected officials really listen to. And I'm glad to see your, your postcards because that shows a group cohesion that's more, uh, as important as it is, the single voice as important as that is, and I don't want to diminish it, organized voices has a greater impact. And just to lift up, because I got it, being a 35 plus year of the League of Women Voters, <laughs> much of what you're doing is, we, is what we have done historically. Um, but we expand on it by having community meetings around an issue, and and um, but we don't don't never endorse um, candidates. We guard our nonpartisanship. I mean that's that's critical to who we are. But I want to say that that your group is just another way of doing it and having impact. Thank you. Maybe if I, what I what morning of the week do you need? Friday you? mornings at eight thirty. It is very grassroots, and many of them, <laughs> that's what my mom always says, or 10. <laughs> um, 
Uh, many of the members of our group are active yeah. members of other organizations yeah. like League of Women Voters, and I would say on that, I think we're getting close to time, um, that we use resources as well from League of Women Voters, particularly around um, becoming aware of the stances of candidates, as yes. right back to the beginning, step one to vote, but be an informed voter. And there are organizations like that that are so helpful. And uh, Kristen, was it you who just talked about this new site, Countable.com? Well, Pete oh, did. Yeah. Countable.com, which I've never heard of, tells if you're really into this stuff. I'm sure my sister's gonna be on this in a minute now. It tells you every time your candidate votes. You get a message every time your, your I shouldn't say your candidate, every time your representative votes, you get a, you get a message to tell you what they voted on and how. I think that's just a really cool um, resource. Um, would anybody else like to go back in the last, uh, what time should we finish? Uh, in one minute. Okay. <laughs> Then we won't go back. And, uh, but I do encourage you, you are all welcome at any time. We welcome your feedback in terms of if you have an idea for an issue, whether that's today. Uh, we have resources here. There's a few more resources on the table. If you'd like to stay a few minutes, I'm going to stay and um, sit here and talk about what we write. Uh, but you're very welcome to join us. And um, thank you for the opportunity to St. Matthews. Thank you for inviting us. We haven't done anything like we've talked in a few environments before, but this is uh, the first time in a uh, church, and we're very grateful. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll hang around by the table. Would you close us in prayer? Oh. <laughs> All right, uh, let's pray. We thank you. God, for your presence with us today. We ask you to continue to guide us. We ask you to help us walk out of the church doors, fed by your word, fed by your body and blood, ready to engage in the world that you love. Amen. Amen. Thank you for what you're doing.